Hello, you bearded bastards, and welcome back once again to Usheng Bagush, Monster Killer. Now, it's currently the 7th of Granite, 266, the start of a brand new year. One full of new hopes. Of that, I'm sure. And we really have to start getting our plans into action. The ones we've been talking about for a couple episodes now. It's about damn time, right? But before we do any of that sort of stuff, I just noticed something a bit fishy here. Now, have a look. These doors right here that lead down to the fortress. Just watch. You see that? Right there. They open and then they close again. Seemingly of their own accord. But I think we know better than that, right? No, in fact, it would seem like there are a great many creatures sneaking through the doorways. Ones that we can't currently see. Elves, I'm thinking. And so yeah, we're gonna have to deal with that real quick. It shouldn't take too long. Now, we don't have too many warriors in the fortress currently, because I had just sent the Brass Spikes, Late Gates, and Oily Wasps out to Twinklefolds again. Just to sneak around a bit, we didn't manage to get that book last episode. But we're gonna take our other warriors and send them out. I'm not very concerned, actually. The elves really don't seem very threatening. And so yeah, we're just gonna send the warriors up real quick to deal with them. I don't think it's gonna be a big issue. We just have to push them up out of the stairwell and get them out in the open, you know? One thing's for certain, we can't let them slow us down at all. We're getting our plans into action before the summer's here. We have to, the fortress has gotten way too dangerous these past few months. Constant death, it's horrible. Yeah, look at that, will ya? It really is ridiculous how little threat they pose. Although there are quite a few of them out here, as well as grizzlies and war leopards too. Damn, yeah, there are a lot of them, but no matters. There really is no threat involved. <laughs> this is just crazy. We only have like 15 warriors right now. Shouldn't I be more afraid? <laughs> Ridiculous. And it looks like we're almost there, just chasing off some remaining stragglers, panicking animals, war leopards and such. <laughs> and that looks to be about it. Fantastic. Yeah, the rest are fleeing out into the desert, back to their forest homes. Get the hell out of Usheng Bagush. Well, anyways, back down to the fortress, you guys. Good fighting today. And now that that siege is out of the way, we really have to start getting our plans into action. As I had already said, things have gotten incredibly deadly around the fortress. There are constant beast attacks, and there are constant sieges as well, from the goblins, elves, and I have to assume the humans are going to show up shortly, because we attacked their precious village looking for our book that they stole. Bunch of bastards. But yeah, undoubtedly they're going to want some retribution for that. On top of all that, there is rampant discontent in the fortress that we've been dealing with for quite some time, but it only seems to be getting worse. Let's see, at a glance here, I'm counting 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10 corpses at least of dwarves killed by other dwarves, just scattered all over the place. And looking down at the hospital, it's even worse. Although I suppose these are the lucky ones. Mana is a mess around here. Big time. Horrible stuff. Now, the Queen's plans. Let's get to it. We had just sent out some invitations to a select few dwarves. As I was saying last episode, with all this discontent rampant in the fortress, we really should be keeping a closer eye on the more sane dwarves around here. If the majority of dwarves can't respect what we have here, then really they can continue fighting like this. Why should we care? We've tried time and again to make them happy, but nothing works. So to hell with them. Now I had just begun to touch on our plans last episode, but never really got to it. Too many distractions. Now over here we could see kind of a complex looking area. Let me explain. Now this area consists of a small meeting hall, as well as a temple, a small farm area over this way, filled with giant scorpions and cave crocodiles. There's a small storage area, a prison, and a whole lot of bedrooms. Well, 13 of them. And they're more than just bedrooms too. Each one of these suites consists of a bedroom, an office, and a dining room. Now those invitations I was talking about are each going to a dwarf with a good head on their shoulders. And those dwarves will be living in these rooms. And this area over here should have every amenity they need to live a nice, happy life. Away from the chaos in the fortress proper. I certainly have tried to set it up that way anyways. Now if you look over this way, you can see a hallway that leads upwards, right here. And it goes up to the Queen's Quarters, which of course is connected to the fortress. Oh dear. This damn fortress, I'll tell ya. Rackhust Relic Ghost, the Anvil Beater, looses a roaring laughter, fell and terrible. Another fell mood. Yeah, we really have to get those plans in action. I suppose we should watch this play out. Keep in mind, Dwarf, that there are corpses all over the place. You could pick any old one. You don't have to kill another Dwarf. But I suppose our hands are kind of tied on that matter. And it looks like they've claimed a clothier shop. Alright, and they're wandering around now, aimlessly. We know what comes next. Oh, there's a Dwarf nearby. 
Is that Venom Blood? I think that's Venom Blood right there. Get out of here, dude. Alright, looks like he's good. There's a couple more dwarves approaching now. And he entered the cloud, killed a dwarf. Doran. Not too sure who that was. And the construction has begun. Great. It looks like we're getting this place done just in time, really. The fortress is absolutely falling apart. It's insane. Oh, and here it is. Our latest fell artifact. Ratcust Relic Ghost, the anvil beater, has created at Vuth Mugshith, a dwarf bone hatch cover. He claims it as an heirloom in the name of the family ancestor, Shoras Scrapecraft, the crazy cremation of coal. A hatch cover, huh? That's, uh, interesting. Well, let's have a look. The Scandalous Tortures. This is a dwarf bone hatch cover. All craft dwarf ship is of the highest quality. This object is adorned with hanging rings of dwarf bone. Hmm, I'm not too sure what we could do with that, if anything. Again, it's kind of a shameful item, and it's not nearly as interesting as those last two. Not to say that any artifact made out of another dwarf is particularly cool, but you know, I guess I was hoping for a bit more. Eh, oh well. I guess I don't really care what you do with it. Just get out of my sight, will you? All right, now that that devilish nonsense is out of the way, let's finally do this. It's been far too long. Now our guests should be on their way currently. It does state very clearly that they are to be in the new fortress by the beginning of summer. Of course, they don't know exactly what's going on yet. All they know is there's a new construction going on. I have to imagine they're going to be elated. A new start for the best minds in the fortress. Not too sure what all you civilians are doing. You're going to have to be kicked out shortly, so don't get your hopes up too high. That's right, everyone out for now. There you go. Just a safety precaution, as we get a few last things in place. You know. There we go, everyone out. There we are, very good. And they are none the wiser. Alright, and it's looking like we're good actually. We managed to corral all of the guests into the new fortress area, and I locked up these doors over here. Just as Moses Astral went berserk. Damn it all. Moses, the Baroness of Ushangvagush. Damn everything. She was going to be the one who takes care of the fortress out here. Well, I guess that's off the table now. Whoa, hey now. Oh, well, I don't think she was killed yet. But because she's now insane, she has forfeited her title of Baroness, and so the title goes to her heir, Kulet, also known as Wartfist, her eldest son, who just became an adult. Very interesting. Wartfist has inherited the position of Duke of... Maze Monstrous? Hmm. Okay, not Ushang the Goosh? Kind of strange, really. And well, back down here with Moses. Oh boy, yeah, it didn't take long at all. The dwarves just piled on and mutilated her. That is a damn shame right there. She was one of my favorites. Well, we no longer have anybody to lead these dwarves out here. But I gotta tell you, I'm not sure the queen cares that much, honestly. Speaking of which, we're back down here in our new fortress safe zone area. You know, I suppose we should come up with a name for it. We'll have to put some thought into it. Anyways, we just chased out a couple more stragglers, and so now the Queen's Quarters and the Safe Zone are completely free of any crazy dwarves. And so now it's time to lock it up. Well, wall it up, actually. We have to make sure nobody can get in. There we go, fantastic. Completely enclosed. Life in the new fortress begins. This is gonna work out just great, I'm thinking. Look at all these dwarves, all pretty much happy. Pretty much. I mean, there are a few miserable dwarves here. And then there's this one guy just stumbling around obliviously. That's a problem. But not a big problem. I think it's something we could deal with. Now, we just have a few things we have to get in order here. Like, we have to make sure everybody has proper professions. We need all the bases covered if we're going to survive here. Workshops, too. We're going to have to put down some appropriate workshops. Over here at the end of this long tunnel. Far away from where dwarves are going to be sleeping. To prevent disturbance from noise. You know. Boy, our new home is luxurious. I'll tell you. Well, it looks like another dwarf went berserk out in the Forgotten Fortress area. <laughs> Glad we're in here, bunch of bastards. Go ahead and fight amongst yourselves. It's no longer any of our concern. Oh, and this is cute. Our new Duke, the Child, has mandated the construction of certain goods. Oh yes, yeah, so it looks like he is in fact the Duke of Usheng Bagush as well. Oh, and he demands crowns. That is cute. I suppose we can humor the boy. In reality, I don't think he's going to last very long out here. This place is an absolute madhouse. Again, no concern of ours. Back in our well-appointed new home, as I said, there are still a few things we have to get in order here. And I guess one of the first things we should do is go over the dwarves that currently reside here. The lucky few. There are actually 16 people here. Mostly dwarves. All chosen because they seem to have good heads on their shoulders. 
Well, they used to anyways. That was uh, quite a while ago. And I am now seeing that quite a few of them aren't exactly happy anymore. But they can't be too far gone, not like those dwarves out in the old Forgotten Fortress. No, I still have faith in these guys. Well, I suppose we could start out with the Sandblades. Here we see Einod, Blue Axe, leader of the Sandblades, and one of the chosen few. Einod has seen us through countless troubles over the years, and so of course we're going to have her in the new fortress. It just wouldn't be right without her. Yes, she is one hell of a dwarf. And of course she still has her trusty copper axe with her as well. Ezreal Moses, Queen Room, which currently has 63 kills. Very impressive, says I. Now let's see who's next. And yes, I do plan on going over every single one of these dwarves, so get comfy. Next up we have Olin Udardodak, one of the Sandblades. And on top of that, he is also one of our sponsored dwarves. This guy's been around for quite some time, and he was actually involved with that Forgotten Beast to Dust attack a few episodes ago, where all those dwarves started bleeding. Do you remember that? Yeah, he was one of the bleeders right alongside Einod, but he survived, thankfully. And he's doing absolutely fine. Fun fact, he had a pet duck at one point, and he was quite fond of the thing, but it has since died. I believe it was in one of those Forgotten Beast Dust attacks. Dust or gas or something like that anyways. Poor thing. But the dude seems to be doing absolutely fine. Well, for the most part anyways. He has more than 40 kills to his name. Just by the way. Next up we have another Sandblade, Ingish, who has been a Sandblade for quite some time. Ingish has more than 40 kills to his name. And he did formerly have a pretty good head on his shoulders, although he's a bit angry these days. I'm sure that'll turn around in time though. Our new fortress is pretty wonderful. Fun fact, he's one of the few dwarves in Ushang Vagush to use a warhammer. Most dwarves seem to prefer battle axes, but not this guy. He has no family, no pets, and doesn't really care about anything anymore. A nice hardened dwarf. Exactly what we need here. Next up we have another sponsored dwarf, Feb Kick Crossed Rosat, another of our Sandblades. Now, this guy was not originally in the Sandblades, but I had chosen him because he has a good head on his shoulders, and on top of that, I was going to have him and his wife live in this new fortress. But unfortunately, his wife was killed in that last Goblin Siege. And I thought he might still have a good head on his shoulders, but we can see right now he's stumbling around obliviously, just kind of in a panic running from room to room. The poor guy. That's gotta be rough. Really hoping he can keep it together. If not, then I'm not sure what we could even do. One thing's for certain, we can't have any tantrums here. None at all. It just can't happen. So you better watch yourself, Feb. I have faith in you, my friend. Oh, you know what? Another thing that could be getting him down, actually, now that I'm thinking of it, is the fact that his spleen is mangled beyond recognition. I don't know how the hell that would have happened. So yeah, I guess I would be a little upset if that happened to me too. But again, you're gonna have to hang in there, buddy. No trouble out of ya. Next up, we have Ered, another sand blade and a mercenary. Ered is a goblin, one of the sons of that diplomat who died last episode. Now, Ered's little brother lived in the fortress too, but he died a couple years back in a goblin attack. You know, I really do have a soft spot for this guy. He's very skilled and seemingly very loyal. He has always done what we've asked him to do, despite the fact that this fortress has been the end of his father and brother. Yeah, I have some real faith in this guy. Plus, I figured we should have another warrior in here, and I needed someone to fill the spot. So. Here we are. Fun fact, Ered really hasn't been in the fortress for that long compared to the other dwarves in here, but currently, he has 72 kills, which is damn fine. He's a ferocious warrior, I'll give him that. Yes, quite a goblin. Now that's going to about do it for the Sandblades, but we have quite a variety of other dwarves here as well. Let's have a look at them too. Well, let's see, for the first of our civilian dwarves, we have Einol Rosenmosas, a trap maker, who is really not in a great mood, at all. They're very depressed, and actually you may have seen it right there, but they were laying on the floor in the middle of their doorway, just laying there, depressed. She did have a good head on her shoulders. Ugh. These dwarves, I'll tell ya. Just hang in there, please. We're gonna need a good engineer. Damn it. Just uh, take it easy for a little bit, okay? Please? Next up we have Degel Nolfeb. And this here is a dwarf who's been around for quite some time. Degal showed up in Ushang Bagush in the year 251, 15 years ago, and he's been here ever since. He's one of the log tossers, in fact I think he was the very first one, which is really saying something. He's a good dwarf, and I'm glad to have him here in the new fortress. Truly, he's bound to be an asset. And after Degal we have Dusum, Ushang Bagush's faithful beastmaster. Look at this guy here. 
doing absolutely fine. He really is an unsung hero of the fortress. He's not unhappy right now, and that is saying something. Definitely. Now he's the beast master, but he's also a legendary rock crafter. So I figure I can have him making crafts here in the new fortress, as well as a few other things. We do have scorpions and cave crocodiles in here as well, and so he can tend to them. Next up we have Katen Mersethanod, our bone mender. This guy is the chief medical dwarf of the fortress, and has been for quite some time, since 251 at least, so again 15 years or so. Talk about unsung heroes, every wounded dwarf who has ever gone to the hospital has dealt with Katen, and more often than not he's able to heal them. Isn't that great? What a hero. Yeah, he really does some great work. He once had a pet peacock, but it died many years ago unfortunately. And on top of that, he likes rabbits. For their long ears. Oh, and I should also note that he received a pretty bad beating when we were out in the old fortress. I believe it was Endok who beat him. I'm pretty sure. I thought Katten was a goner. But he survived and he came right back. No problem whatsoever. A very close call. After that we have Zan Stukosnar, the Overseer of Wushangvegush, and yet another unsung hero. She's been the Overseer for probably 15 years as well, which entails being a manager, bookkeeper, and broker, and she's done a damn fine job at it. Oh, you know, I'm just noticing now that she had a lover in the fortress, Tobol, but unfortunately he's no longer with us. He was turned into an artifact crown last episode. You may remember that. <laughs> Very unfortunate. Yeah. Yeah, it's rough. Ah, oh well. Hang in there, Zan. You're doing a great job and we need you. Next up we have Bomrek Migrurketen, a Larder Lord. Now admittedly, I don't know much about this guy, other than the fact that he's been in the fortress for about 10 years, and that he's a Larder Lord. Not much to say, really, I had a look in his mindset, and he seems like a fairly easygoing fellow that can handle stress, and he's also kind of a jokester too, who dreams of raising a family, which is great news, I'm really hoping he gets to do that one day, that's for sure. And I'm sure he will. Absolutely positive, actually. Next up, we have Stinthad, Venomblood, who, much like Doosum, seems to have a very good head on his shoulders. Yeah, he's really keeping it together very well, given the circumstances. Still a young dwarf, but he has proven to be able to hold himself together very well under stress. A very important trait, definitely. Yeah, this guy has had the world thrown at him. He was savaged by a giant cave spider as a baby, and then both his parents died in combat. Not good. But he has really proven himself time and again, and he's still going too. Now he's a clothier, but I figure I'm gonna have him doing some other stuff too. Kinda like do some. Just odd jobs here and there. It's gonna be important, you know? There's plenty to do. The next dwarf we have here is Momaz, also known as a Rapite. Yet yeah, another dwarf who's been in Ushangvagush for quite some time. In fact, Momaz here is one of the starting seven dwarves who founded Ushangvagush, which is just insane to me. I don't know how she survived this long, it's kind of crazy, with all the awful things that have gone on in the fortress here. Remember that one time she was chased by a forgotten beast through the caverns, that was a while back. But she managed to outrun it, and it was killed by the warriors. Very lucky. Now, she's an anvil beater, and she's going to continue to be a blacksmith here in the new fortress. I'm not sure that we're going to have that much work for her at the start here, but eventually I'm sure she's going to be necessary. Keep on trucking, Rapite. Hell of a dwarf. Next, we have an elf named Atera Venevuelu. Isn't that strange? Yes, we're allowing an elf into the new fortress, because Atera here is a master speaker and also knows all sorts of poetry and dances. They're actually a part of the entertainment group known as the Fabulous Dots that we accidentally allowed into the fortress a while back, and I figured as long as we're going to be stuck in this tiny new fortress here, we might as well have some entertainment too. None of the dwarves in the fortress are very good at telling stories, or poetry, or dancing for that matter. So what the heck, right? Oh, and if you're wondering, he does not have one of the large rooms. No, no. Atera's room is over here. Very tiny. Still fairly well appointed, but not as nice as the dwarf rooms. You know how it is. It gets the job done. All right, we're getting there. Only two dwarves left, and the next one we see is our queen, Obak Sodalum, the Bat Killer, currently sitting in her personal bedroom, probably just contemplating about all the information she's learned in the past few months from the books, from those necromancers. I have to imagine she's also reflecting on the state of the fortress. I mean, how could you not? I feel bad for her. She's the original expedition leader who came to Ushangvagush. She's the one who brought the dwarves here to the Born Dunes to fight monsters. 
which they did, in glorious fashion, might I add. But over time, I guess things just got a little complex, we'll say. Yeah, over time, more and more stuff got added onto her pile, and everything just stopped being so simple. It started with us fighting monsters. Easy enough, right? But then the goblins started attacking us. Okay, so add that to the pile. When that started happening, we increased the size of our military, and we started attacking the goblins. Alright, bound to happen. While we were attacking the goblins, we got that book, Foundations of City Seduce. Which is fine and dandy, but those damn humans from the south, the untamed kingdoms, wanted that book. And of course we didn't just want to give it to them. So they started being pests about that. Then the elves show up. They start begging us to stop cutting down trees. Our trees. And of course that ended up getting pretty annoying. Which led to the war with the elves. All this stuff is accumulating too. Making life in the fortress more and more difficult. Which meant that the queen had a ton on her plate. But still while this was all happening, we managed to continue improving the fortress in many ways. Like this for example. Our forgotten beast viewing pen. Such a glorious addition. It was the queen who ordered this place to be built, for the glory of Usheng Bagush. But I'm starting to think that it was this right here, the construction of this pen, that started the fortress on its downward spiral. I mean, think about it. The queen wanted it to be built for the glory of the fortress, but the dwarves aren't necessarily going to see that. In fact, more often than not, when dwarves come in here, and they happen to catch a glimpse of the bat, they run away terrified. Overall, this room is not a great place for dwarves to be. On top of that, think about it. This is a forgotten beast, the exact thing we're supposed to be here to kill, and she has the thing here displayed as a pet. Now I'm willing to bet that many of the dwarves who live here don't see this construction as something that glorifies the fortress. Instead, I'm thinking it's more likely that they see it as a way for the queen to glorify herself, you know? I mean, I wouldn't blame them for thinking so. That's kind of how it looks to me, really. Of course, I wouldn't blame the queen either. As we said, she's had so much on her plate. She couldn't really be blamed for not picking up on the subtle cues from the dwarves. And of course, it probably didn't help that she kept her intentions for this strange new chamber over here hidden from the other dwarves. Some of them might have felt betrayed by that. So yeah, I'm thinking this chamber here was just a bad misstep on the part of the queen. Really a damn shame. But that's all in the past. And it really does not help out our present situation at all. And our situation is dire indeed. The fortress is in a state of almost complete ruin, and we're stuck down here, where we'll have to remain for some time. We don't even know how long, but it might be a long, long time. And I'll tell you what, regardless of how we got in this situation, the queen is pissed. And she needs to take that rage out on something. Or someone. Now then, a couple months back, one of the fortress's artifacts were stolen. You may remember, Foundations of City Seduce, a white jade bound codex, that we found in one of the goblin pits that we destroyed. And that book was stolen by a bunch of filthy humans from the south, the untamed kingdoms, who have had their eye on the thing for a while now. Now, for the longest time, that book was stored here, in our old museum, on a clear zircon pedestal. Remember? And we have had a ton of adventurers come who asked to take the thing back to Twinklefolds to be stored in a library there. But of course we declined. There are plenty of books in the world, go get your own. Bunch of beggars. Anyways, if you look in the museum here, you can see that the book and the pedestal on which it was placed are no longer here. That's because we had just moved it. Right before it was stolen, we had that pedestal and the book moved here to the Queen's personal library where most of the books in the fortress are currently. This was all part of the secret project, her own personal study where she could pour over the information in the many books that we found. Now you can see that clear pedestal is up here, and we had just moved Foundations of City Seduce to that pedestal, almost the instant it was stolen. Now right about the time we were building this library, and we got that book in place, we had another addition added to the Queen's Quarters, right here. If you have a look, this is a bronze bridge that can be raised and lowered with the use of this lever over here, tucked behind the queen's bed. A little secret entrance, if you will. It goes up a whole long way to this room right here. It's a small 2Z level tall chamber, bisected by a wall. And in that wall is a door. An artifact door, the Sibner can. A lapis lazuli door. Now this door is safely locked, but if one were to unlock it from our side, you could continue up this staircase down here, all the way up, through this rocky path, which leads to the bottom of this dried up pond on the surface. Very hard to spot, but it allows safe access to and from the Queen's quarters, if need be. Now just around the time that book was stolen, 
we were just getting Sibnarkan into place. And of course it didn't take too long for that to happen. There was only really a window of a couple of days. And I'm pretty sure that's when the adventurer came in and snatched that book. There's no other possible way. The book was down in the Queen's quarters, and they must have just snuck through this tunnel into the Queen's bedroom and took the book. Now I can't imagine that one of those damn thieves would show up right this second we get that book in place and we finish digging out that secret tunnel. The whole project was a secret. Nobody knew about it, except for maybe a select few dwarves. I mean, nothing's totally secret in this fortress. Word gets around, you know. Now, I had mentioned at the end of last episode that I thought somebody in this fortress might be responsible for letting that book get stolen. And if we have a look over here, you can see one last dwarf currently in our new fortress here that I did not mention. This here is Obak Vebakatsas, the fortress's only scholar. Now, this fellow wanted to be an alchemist a while ago, but we never really had a call for it, so we assigned him to be the scholar. So most of his time was spent in the library, researching that sort of stuff, nothing too thrilling really. And in fact, this was one of the dwarves we had selected to be part of our new fortress program here. But that was before that book was stolen, and other information came to light. Now Obak here was our first actual scholar in the fortress. Uh, keep in mind too that his name is Obak, the same as our queen. Don't be confused. Anyways, this Obak here, was our fortress's first dwarven scholar, but we eventually got a second scholar too, who is still out in the fortress. Right here, laying on the ground, currently severely wounded, and probably doesn't have long for this world either. They were beaten severely not too long ago. Now, this human scholar here had petitioned to live in Usheng Bagush for the purpose of study, maybe five, six years ago, something like that, and it was never even anything I mentioned. I figured, sure, we could use another scholar, why not? And so this human, Aquos Pimradenkov and our Dwarven Scholar Obak spent most of their time in the library researching together and they became close friends. And actually, this Aquos here is a renowned biographer and really a very well-known scholar. And eventually, this Aquos here was kind enough to take Obak as his apprentice. Obak not having much skill in researching, study, that sort of stuff. I thought that was pretty cool to have a master teaching him the ropes. Couldn't hurt, right? I certainly thought so. Until that book was stolen and I picked up on a certain bit of information. I had received a notification during our previous Goblin Siege that this Aquos character here became the Lord of a group of humans known as the Fenced Coalition, which has happened before, a long time ago, to some of our monster slayers. And usually the group is nothing interesting really, the government of some human town or something like that. But the Fenced Coalitions is a human group that was formed in Twinklefolds where I assume our book was taken. Seems like a mighty coincidence that this guy becomes Lord right after the book is stolen, after they've tried for so many years to take it. And the thing was stolen too by a human named Aspa, who is in fact the very first human to come and inquire about that book. What are the chances of that? I did a little digging on her as well, and she is a knowledge seeker for the Fenced Coalition. So these two must know about each other, treacherous scum. Now we had learned about all this new information just before we got the dwarves into our safe zone, and so Obak made sure this guy was beaten before she got safely into the new fortress. Sure that he would die eventually, but he still seems to be hanging on, no matter though. But that does leave us with our friend over here, Obak the Scholar. Now we'll have to try to figure out something to do with this guy. He is severely wounded right now because the queen had him beaten as well, and then dragged in here right before the doors were locked so she can keep an eye on him. But because of his current state, I don't think he's going to last much longer. And so I think we might have to dole out his punishment before he leaves this world. Mainly as a reminder to these other people to stay in line while we're in the new fortress. But I'm not too sure what form that punishment shall take. And at this point, it looks like we'll have to wait until next episode to see. Well, you bearded bastards, I truly hope you enjoyed watching this episode. And I certainly hope you'll join me next time here in Usheng Bagush. Monster Killer. And until then, you bearded bastards, 